It's good to be here with you guys today. How you doing? Good. Everybody's good? Fred's well. That's good. This is awesome. Oh, man. I have to get one good Fred laugh in every sermon here. It makes me happy. Oh, man. You know, I, I just, oh, man, Melissa's prayer just blessed me today. I, that, I, I'm preaching this whole sermon in the hopes that that prayer gets answered in my life, in your life, and in everybody's life. That's what I want for us. And so I just want to ask you today, as you think about your life, you know, what's the good life? What's your definition? What's your version of the good life? Um, you know, do you ever think about it? My, my guess is you do, whether you are aware you're thinking about it or not. I think it's something we all think about. You know, if, if you ask 100 people, you'll get about 100 variations on a few themes, and I really think it's worth a conversation. I, I think it's something that's worth talking about and thinking about B because we all have a version in our souls, whether we can articulate it or not, of what the good life is and the life that, that is in our heart that we want to be able to live. And, and, and it's really, really important because I think all of us have gone after things thinking that they would give us life only to find they didn't. I mean, anybody have anything gathering dust in their garage right now? Yeah, I mean, we all. I, I, don't, I won't even bother to name it because it's, it's too many to name, right? We have things that, man, that's really going to make my life great. And yeah, there it sits. And, and, and so what is this and I, I you know you ask that question and usually the answers start pretty shallow right vacations you know nice vacations um, travel activities experiences maybe you know some cars a house a life with no worries right so that's the vacation in Jamaica I'm on you know you all of that um, but but you start going down the road and having that conversation and you know, as I've talked about it with people, basically three things start to emerge. The first is um, healthy relationships, right? Characterized by love and trust. That's critical to the good life. Second is inner peace, inner joy and peace, characterized by a sense of well being and happiness. And third, Having a sense of purpose characterized like, by feeling like my life matters. And, and, and the truth of the matter is, is if you have these three things, any material stuff that you might add to it is just icing. It's just icing on the cake. It's, it, it's filler. I mean, what makes that dream vacation a dream vacation more than the fact that you're in this beautiful place, what, with People you love, right? People you trust, people you feel safe with. You can have the best vacation in the world, and if you don't have that, is that going to be a great vacation? Are you living the life? You know, the answer is no. You know, you're living the life because you had that before you went on vacation. Because you were already living the good life. See, the material stuff just fills in the edges. I really believe that these are the three most important things in living the good life. Now, I want to ask you, are you pursuing the good life? Are you pursuing it? Because I, I, if you're not, I think you should. I want to encourage you today. Pursue this. This is worth going after. Um, and, and, and do you have a clear picture of what this is and what this means in your life? And, and, and if you don't, I, I, I want to ask you to think about clarifying that in your mind. And, um, and, and honestly, that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. And, and, and I want you to be confident that what you're shooting for really is the good life and won't end up hanging in the garage gathering dust someday. But that, but that what, you're, what you give your life to is really what is fulfilling and, and, and makes life truly good. Because I believe that, that that desire that you have for the good life is a God-given desire. I, I believe that that is something that God has hardwired in your heart to want, to crave, and, 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 and to find satisfaction in. And, and, and the one question I have for this, though, is why? Why is it sometimes so elusive for us, right? Why is that so elusive for us? Well, last week, 
you know, we started this new series, Uncommon Sense. And we're examining some of the paradoxical statements of Jesus and his closest followers in the hopes that God will transform our, our lives by renewing our minds so that we can test and approve, that we can understand what God's will is because God's will is what is good and is what is perfect and it is what is pleasing. And we want to, we want to be in line with that uh, for our lives. And that's kind of what this whole series is about. And, and, and last week we started with this whole idea of restoration. And, you know, uh, Andy made a comment. He said, what a crazy place to start the conversation about renewing our minds. And, you know, you know, why do we start the conversation there? And let me tell you why we started it where we did last week, talking about rest and restoration. Because the truth of the matter is, so many of us are so busy and so exhausted, we can't think straight. And we need a rest. I mean, what's the purpose of a vacation? Rest. Recover, right? Recover from everything that happened. But I want to give you one more thing to add to your vacation list. I think one of the purposes of vacation is to get far enough away from your life, far enough out of your life so that you can look back at your life and get a perspective on it. So that you can see it and you can, and you can begin to... to Ask yourself, is, am I really living this life? And creating some space and creating distance. And, and we saw last week how God is calling us to create that space. He's calling us to, to make that space for rest, you know, so that he can do so many good things in our lives. And, um, you know, sometimes we're so busy pursuing the good life, we just end up living an exhausted life, Right? And I think Jesus wants to give us rest so we can get his perspective. And, and obviously that's why we're here. That's we, why we come to church. Why we, we gather together less this on, like this on weekends and in small groups. is because the, we're, we're, what we talked about last week. I'm going to use a word. You can get the, the definition of it last. Go listen to last week's sermon. We're, we're Sabbathing. And go listen to next week if you don't know what I meant by that. Or la listen to last week. Listen to next week too, but li listen to last week for that information. Um, you know, and, and one of the things I want to say as we get started in this is uh, we need to kind of guard ourselves because I think we have a natural tendency um, to maybe think that, that, that God is our enemy in this pursuit. That, that, you know, that passage of scripture that we read in worship about you know, living a life in true righteousness and true holiness. Sometimes in our minds, we, we kind of dis, we separate those two. Of, you know, there's the good life, and then there's righteousness and holiness. And I want to tell you that those two are the same. That they go together today. And, and, and that we need to start trusting God. He's not the enemy of this pursuit of the good life. And the second thing I want us to kind of get straight in our minds too. Before we launch into this. Is that God is not the enemy of this pursuit of the good life. And neither is he your caddy. Anybody know what a caddy does? Carries your clubs. Helps you read the green. Kind of helps you do, help me out what you want to do. No, he's not your enemy in this. He is for you more than you know, and I'm going to show you that in just a, a few seconds here. But neither is he your caddy. He's your leader. And he's the one that wants to lead you into this good life. And so the question is, do you, do I, will we really trust him? So, a little context in this first verse. If you want to open your Bibles to John chapter 10, verse 10, page 773, if you grabbed one of the Bibles on your way in here this morning. John chapter 10, verses 10 to 15. Um, the context of this is that Jesus is using a metaphor of a shepherd and sheep in order for him to be able to communicate the kind of relationship that he wants to have with us and the depth of his love and his commitment for us and for us to understand, to kind of get a picture and to understand of, of how we can be in this relationship, at least from his end, what he is longing for, all right? So this is Jesus coming at this from his side of the story. And, and it starts right here in John chapter 10, verse 10. Would you just read this with me? The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. All right? 
So, so here we are. And now, now keep that in mind. And I want to just read what Jesus says after this. Remember, I've come that you would have life and you would have it to the full. And then Jesus says this. I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd. And does not own the sheep, so when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks, and the flock scatters, and and the man runs away because he's a hired hand. He cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I Lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus is so committed to this abundant, this full life that that he is willing to lay down his life for you and to get his good life. Isn't that good news today? He, he, is, he, is, so, he is so committed to this, and, and it is a good life. Recently, I was reading the blog of a Christ follower who works in a very secular and sometimes anti-Christian setting. And, and, and often, she says, people will ask me, why in the world do you follow Jesus? Why in the world are you a Christian? And, and she looks at him. She has a lot of different answers depending on the person. But this particular blog, I just found so powerful because what she said is, the reason why I am a Christian is because I have read the New Testament, And I have read the life that God wants for me. I have read about the kind of person that he wants me to become. I have read about what he wants to do through me. And and then in the whole balance of the blog, she just goes passage after passage after passage, laying out what God desires to do in and through her. And she says, and my heart wants that for myself because that's the living that's the life that i want and and in the blog she she quotes a friend who she had shared this with and and her friend responded and said you know that's exactly what happened to me in middle school i was challenged to read through the whole new testament and as a middle schooler I, i i read about the life that jesus wanted for me and i said i want that and it was then Only then, as he saw the life God wanted for him, that he saw the thief that came to steal and kill and destroy, and he saw his need for Jesus to lay down his life to deliver him from that thief. And who is the thief? Who is the thief that comes to steal and kill and destroy and rob us of the abundant life? Now we're getting to why is this good life so elusive? I'll take the verse right out of the blog. It's a great verse. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Christ died for our sins. According to what? According to the scriptures. Christ died for our sins. You see, the thief isn't out there someplace. The thief is right in here. It's in every single one of us. The thief to the abundant life that God wants to have, the life to the full, the life that is rich, the life that is truly the good life that our hearts are hardwired to desire by God is sin, which is a rebellion toward God. The enemy is within us. Now, some of you are saying, but what about the devil in the world? Let me tell you something. If it wasn't for sin in us, the devil would have nothing to work with. And the world would have nothing to work with. The enemy is sin. By the way, Satan is just a really good sinner. All right, those two words, that's an oxymoron. I've been trying to figure out a better way to say that. The worst sinner, maybe, is the, is the right way to say that. But the enemy is sin. And... and, and And sin, see what it does, it shrinks the good life down to something smaller, more self-centered, usually driven by envy and jealousy of what others have, instead of stepping fully into what God has for us. The the good life is something Jesus calls life to the full, and he thinks it's awesome enough to lay down his life for us to have it. Do you feel loved today? Does anybody else love you that much? What does sin do to us? What does sin do to healthy relationships? It causes selfishness. And selfishness destroys trust, doesn't it? Selfishness destroys 
trust because I'm willing to throw you under the bus. What does it do to inner peace and joy? Sin replaces inner peace and joy with guilt and vague regret. I mean, we live in a society where there is really no grace. And, and, and because there's no grace, nobody can admit they're wrong. Because who would admit they're wrong if you know you're going to get hammered, right? So, like my brother likes to say, you know, deny everything and ask for evidence, right? And that's the way a lot of people live. And if you live that way, I guarantee two things are going to happen to your soul. The first thing that's going to happen to your soul is you are going to have guilt that you don't know what to do with. And you are going to live with a vague regret that you don't understand why it's there. And that's what sin does to you. And it destroys your inner peace and joy. And I am convinced that this one right here, the inner peace and joy, that guilt and regret is the reason why there is so much addiction. Is because if you don't know how to deal with it, about the only thing you can do is medicate. It's about all you can do. You're stuck. But that's what sin does. And not only that, what does sin do to our sense of purpose? Well, it disconnects us from God's greater purpose for good and, and for a, <laughs> and it trades it in for a smaller self-made. I'll come up with my own purpose. And usually clipped from the pages of our favorite magazine or Pinterest or TV show or something. And Jesus says, I have come that you would have life and that you would have it to the full. I want you to have a life and the, that, that, is, that is overflowing. The image here is of a cup that is being filled to all that it can hold. And, and the waitress just keeps right on pouring. That's the image right here. It's about to go over the table. You are about to be grabbing napkins. And moving quickly because it's spilling down onto your pants, all right? That's the image of what Jesus is saying that I want you to have. Not dirty pants, but just, you know, the overflowing <laughs> image, all right? Um, so here is because what, what Jesus does is transforming our character from sin into ability to love because we've received his love, because we've lived in his love, because we've accepted his love. Now we're able to take that love and with the love that we have been given, we begin to say, okay, Jesus, if that's what love is and that's what it looks like, now I'm going to start loving others with the self-sacrificing love that you loved me with. And that's what love is. And let me tell you, when you start to love the way he loved you, you begin to restore broken relationships and you will create healthy ones he frees us from guilt because we are forgiven and we are accepted um, because of what he did for us on the cross because of his blood shed for us on the cross we have what the bible calls an atoning sacrifice what does atoning mean honestly the, the best thing is the, the description that we give to children atone at one he is the one who makes us at one with God. And when he died on that cross, it was paying the penalty of everything that you and I owe God for our sins. And it was God saying, I want you to be free from guilt. I want you to be free from shame. I don't want guilt and shame and vague regret to control your life anymore. I want to come in. I want to release you. I want you to be able to admit what's going on. I want you to be able to be free of all of that. And I can fill you with my peace. I can fill you with my joy. And you can live with that instead anybody want that today Amen. that's what he's looking for that's the abundant life that's the abundant life and and he connects us to God's purpose with giving us each and we talked about this last week and this is a theme we're going to be circling around a lot as we go through this uh, through this series today a calling and he has a call on each and every one of our lives at every stage of our lives. It doesn't matter whether you're, a, you know, you're young, you're old, you're somewhere floating in the middle. He has a calling for you. He is, he's not just, you're not just going through your life. He is calling you into life, into everything that you are doing. And he is gifting you by the Holy Spirit to his noble purpose. And any purpose less than God's purpose for your life is not worthy of you. It's not worthy of you. Because you are the image of God. 
and you're being remade into the image of Christ. And you are made for his eternal, noble purposes. And all this because Christ died for our sins to free us from sin's power. But now we come to the really important question. How do I take hold of this life? And now it's time for some uncommon sense. Now, now is the point where Jesus looks us in the eye. He holds out his hand and he says, now do you trust me? Because I want to tell you what it's going to take for you to really begin to walk into this life that I have for you. Because the way you take hold of this life, and here's the paradoxical statement is that we're going to live this life by dying. That's how we live this life. Not common sense, is it? But listen to what Jesus says. Let's read this passage together. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. And this life that he has for us is ours. If you want to live life to the full, you need to trust Jesus enough to die, and this is what I love, with him. Have you ever thought about it that way? He's not just saying, I want you to go die. He's saying, no, I want you to die with me. This is something you and I are going to do together. You're not on your own in this. You're going to do this with me. Now, how's that for a paradox? Well, let me explain it a little bit. It all happened one day when Jesus was trying to explain a bit more about that laying down his life stuff that we were talking about earlier. And, and in Matthew chapter, chapter 16... Um, verse 21, just before the passage that we just read, um, it says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, that he must suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that they must be killed, and on the third day, he would be raised to life. Now, now that's what he said. But let me read it to you the way that his disciples heard it because I think this is often the way when Jesus gives this, I want, I, you got to die to live. When we hear this, I think we, we hear that statement the same way the disciples heard what Jesus said. And so, so what they heard was Jesus said, you know, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, that he must be killed. And all the third he raised from the leg. Anybody, any men ever listen to your wives that way? You listen to the first half of the sentence, don't listen to the second half of the sentence, right? Terry and I just had a little, little conversation about that because we were doing a little remodeling project and, and she wanted to remove this wall and she, you know, it was all in clear in her mind how it was going to go. And she said, so we're going to move this wall. And I looked at the wall and I thought, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a switch box there. That's going to be moved. And let me tell you, after that, I never heard a word she said. I was just thinking about the switch box. How, how in the world am I going to move that switch box? Because she wasn't thinking about those things. But that's the way the disciples are listening to Jesus right here. He says, I'm going to die. And they're kind of like, no. And I, if they were listening, don't you think, don't you think that they might have just asked a little bit, so tell me a little bit more about this resurrection thing? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you expect there'd be just this much curiosity about that resurrection thing? I'm going to raise from the dead? No, because they stopped listening. They, they, they let go of that. And, and you know, in, instead, Peter takes Jesus aside. Verse 22 begins to rebuke him. Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Now, this is something we all got to get over, by the way, if we're going to die to ourselves. Peter's no dumber. He's following Jesus because he wants the good life. And Jesus wants it for him. But when Jesus says that he must be killed, that Jesus must be killed, you know, it doesn't take Peter much to figure out, wait a second, if you're going to be killed and I'm with you. <laughs> and, you know, if I want to live, don't I live? You know, I live by living. That makes sense. That's common sense. Tells you you live by living. 
And Jesus says, you know, you got to have some uncommon sense. And, and in fact, the word that Peter uses when it says never, Lord, those words could actually be kind of translated, God forbid, Lord. In other words, Jesus, I know you're saying that, but I'm going to pray against it. That's not what I'm going to pray for for you. And Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Because you're thinking with common sense. You're thinking from somebody who's living from a purely human, physical level here. You don't have in mind the things of God. You don't have the perspective of God. You don't have his uncommon sense right now. You're, not, you're thinking with the wrong mind. Because you see, Jesus knows that the good life is going to require a resurrection. And on the third day, he will rise. But there's this really uncomfortable truth about resurrections. Anybody know what they are? You gotta die if you want a resurrection. And the new life that God wants to give you, that's everything that we talked about earlier, requires a resurrection, which means that there's things that just have to die if you and I are going to experience this new life. Um, that's why Jesus says, so whoever, you know, he, he stops this whole thing, and he says, because, and he's really, really clear, because he's been talking about how I'm going to die, but now he says, I just want to be really, really clear to you all. Yes, I am going to die, and if you're going to truly be my follower, guess what? You're going to have to pick up your cross and walk with me to the place of crucifixion. You're going to have to walk with me. Why is that? Why? Because whoever wants to save their life, who's going to hang on to this life, is going to lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good is it for someone to, to gain the whole world and forfeit their soul? What can anyone give in exchange for the soul? Because frankly, the, the, there's a time coming when the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's, Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each one according to what they have done. Which life have they lived? Have they lived the old dead life or have they lived the new resurrection life with him so let you've got to let go and trust jesus has a better way because if you if you want life to the full you need to trust jesus enough to die for with him so what needs to die first selfishness selfishness so that we can truly love and be trustworthy you know, we need and the bible says if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body you will live and we need the holy spirit's help to combat the natural normal selfishness that every one of us lives our life with Selfishness has to die so that, so that we can have healthy relationships because you can't have, the more selfish you are, the worse your relationships are. The less selfish you are, the better your relationships. Now, does that make sense? That's common sense. And that's what Jesus wants to do, but it, something's got to die. The second thing is self-righteousness, that this idea that, you know, that, that, that resists conviction, that resists repentance, that says, I'm self, I'm good. I'm good. The problem's you. That's self-righteousness. I have dinner with people all the time who's, who's married, dinner, uh, conversations with people all the time who's, who's, are really great at telling me the problems with their spouse not so clear on their own. 
at self-righteousness. But we need to be died to self-righteousness so that we can repent. And, and that, that we can receive real forgiveness. Because if you can't repent, you can't receive the forgiveness. Now the forgiveness is there like a, like a birthday present sitting in your lap. Jesus died that you could be forgiven. He, he's, he's wrapped it. He's set it in your lap. Forgiveness is here in your lap. It's yours. And a lot of people look at him and say, but I don't need it. I'm fine. That's self-righteousness. And until you die to that, you'll never open the gift of the forgiveness that could be yours in Christ. That's waiting for you to receive. I mean, this is pride and everything else. But when we do that and we receive real forgiveness by the blood of Jesus Christ, it ends our guilt and shame. It deals with our vague regret have you ever had anybody, have you ever, have you ever done that? Because there's this verse that talks about confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you might be healed. Have you ever done that confess your sin to one another and pray for each other thing? If you haven't, you should. All right? And, but then you got to conclude it this way because you're not the one who forgives, really. God is the one who forgives. But, but as you do that and as you're working through that with somebody, to, to have somebody look you in the eye and say, that was covered by the blood of Christ. Have you ever had anybody look you in the eye and remind you of that at the point of your sin? If you have not, oh, baby, you need to. There is nothing that will reorder the terrain of your soul than the grace of God when you receive it and you just hear and, and, you, and you receive the truth that it's covered by the blood of Christ and I am forgiven. And there is no better, greater, richer sense of peace and joy that will be in your heart than when you receive that. And finally, we've got we've to get rid of self-determination. Oh man, I know God loves me, but i got a really good plan for my life. How about you? But we need to get rid of self-determination so that we can truly answer God's call for our lives to follow the lead of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. And, to, to, and if we will do that, we will live our lives with a sense of his purpose. I don't care how meaningless your job is. I don't, I don't care if you look at your job that you're in right now and you say, man, this, is, this isn't important. You know, I want to tell you right now that If God has called you to it, that doesn't matter. Because there's maybe the job itself isn't important, but I guarantee you there's something critically, eternally important that he's called you to in it. So do it really well. Apply yourself to it uh, as, as unto the Lord with everything that you have because God is at work in your life to will and to do according to his good purpose. Do you believe it today, church? And, and he is doing stuff that you won't maybe know till heaven and he points back and says, thank you for grinding it out day after day after day for love of me because look what I have done through the fruit of your labors. Because you showed up and the lights went out. (laughs) Oh man, that's funny. (laughs) Folks, the good life Life to the full. It's found through trust in Jesus. I love Galatians 2.20. Is everything working? Oh, there we go. Can I get Galatians 2.20? Poor Steve was a little distracted there. Here we go. Would you read this with me? I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. Oh, there you are. All right. 
and there you go. Oh, man. Yeah, this is going to be a real poignant emotional moment right now. Oh, let's keep it simple here then, shall we? On the tear-off, there's a question. It simply asks you, what's your next step? Do you want what God wants for you? Uh, do you want it bad enough that you're willing to, to die? And it, maybe you're here today and, and you haven't started exploring. It's time. I want to encourage you. I want to invite you if, just to start exploring this. I'm so glad you're here. If, you, if you're just trying to figure out something, you know, spiritually, and maybe it's still just vague in your head, even while you're here. I'm so glad you're here. Because it might be vague in your head what you're looking for, but it's not vague to God why he's called you here. And I just want to invite you to be a part of this family. I want to invite you to get into a small group and, you know, just, just, just come and be with us. I guarantee you, some of us are a mess too, all right? You know, and all of us are a mess at some point, right? And um, so th there's, there's, this is a body of believers that really does, I believe, have very little self-righteousness, and I'm very happy for that. Um, you know, we don't think much necessarily. We're not too impressed with ourselves, but we are impressed with Jesus. And so this is a safe place, and I just invite you in. Maybe you're ready to cross that line, and, and, and you're just ready to admit that you are you know, selfish, self-righteous, and self-determined, and you just want to say, today is the day, Jesus, for the first time, I want to, I want to start dying to all of that. And, and put your faith in Jesus. So just, you know, just start with the starting point that he loves you. He died on the cross. And when you receive that forgiveness, you are starting with a clean slate with God. And he'll lead you into whatever clean slate you need to create in the mess around you. But you're going to start right there, free from guilt and free from shame. Maybe that's what you need to do today. If that's the case, then just give your life to Jesus today. Maybe, maybe you, you're just at a place where you've kind of taken your foot off the gas and you're just distracted. And you haven't really been thinking about how do I pursue this life? How do I really go after it with Jesus? How do I, how do I put to death the misdeeds of my body by the, by the Spirit's power so that I can really live? And you really haven't been focusing on that. And maybe today is the day that you're just going to say, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm refocusing. I'm bringing it on. Or maybe, maybe you're listening to me and this is just exciting you because you already have been on it like a rat on a Cheeto. I mean, you have, been, you have been going after it with everything you have. And, and if that's the case, you just keep going after it with abandon. Let's do this together, shall we? If you want me to pray for you, the pastoral team to pray for you, just jot a note on that tear-off. We will pray for you. I tell you what, here's what you pray for me. Just pray that I keep my foot on the gas, would you? And that, uh, that I eat the whole Cheeto. So let's go. <laughs> now to him who is able to keep you from falling when you decide that you are going to take up your cross and follow him. Because he is able to lead you all the way to his glorious throne where the day is going to come when he is going to present you to his father. And you will be blameless. You will be pure. You will be holy. You will be without fault. And he will do it with great joy. To him, to the Lord Jesus who has done it, be all the glory, honor, majesty, and power now, this week, and forevermore. Amen? And have an awesome week.